Ladies and gentlemen, if you could please take a seat so that we con can continue our program now. And before we kick off our exciting program, let me share with you some organizational information. As you know, at the IEF, we give great importance to connecting all space people, and we have recently launched our IEF app to better serve this purpose. In particular, at this event, we want to make sure we address your most burning questions in real time, and therefore, we'll be using a simple audience interaction platform through the IEF app. You can see the information up here behind me uh, that will allow you to download the IEF app. If you haven't done so yet, please join the GEC 2019 event and go to ask a question if you want to ask a question. And the event code for uh, this event today and for all the events today is actually GLEC. If you need Wi-Fi, there are two Wi-Fi uh, networks available for you, and you can see the information behind me. This interaction uh, platform will allow to submit questions from your side, and the audience can also vote the questions or upvote the questions of the other participants, and that will then allow the uh, moderators to always have the questions with the highest number of votes or likes on top. Throughout the conference, you will also be uh, able to express your opinion also by answering to poll questions that will be put forward to the audience, and you will see that during the session. So I hope you will enjoy this new feature, and if you have any technical problems, please address yourself to my colleagues who are in the audience as well. And now let us dive into our program. With the first session. And this first session of the conference has been actually divided in two parts in order to offer you both the space agencies and the industry's perspectives on the benefit of space technology and applications for socioeconomic benefits. Each of the two parts will, composed, uh, will be composed by a keynote at the beginning and a high-level panel featuring some of the main personalities from the two sectors. The first part now will focus on space agencies' point of view, and on this important topic, uh, this important topic will be moderated by um, Mr. Jean-Pascal Buffon, Director of Planning, International Relations and Quality at the uh, French Space Agency CNES. Jean-Pascal is also one of our GLEC 2019 IPC co-chairs, and he has supported us, uh, us throughout the organization of the conference, and I would like to warmly thank him for his precious work and support. Please join me in giving a welcome and a round of applause to Mr. Uh, uh, Jean-Pascal Lefort. Thank you, Christian, and uh, good morning, everybody. It is my great honor to uh, introduce this uh, roundtable on space for emerging countries, developing the uh, benefits of space technologies, applications, products, and services for socioeconomic development. Um, I uh, will introduce, first of all, the uh, keynote uh, speaker, and then we will have a round table with the different speakers. We have organized a very interesting and very high level panel, both with uh, established uh, space agencies, leaders, but also uh, with uh, very prominent representatives of uh, newcomers in space from emerging countries. And I think that, I hope, and we will do as much as we can so that this confrontation and conversation 
between uh, these uh, two uh, important actors are, uh, will be interest for you. And as Christian said, the idea is that you interact as much as you can on, the, uh, on this conversation. So let me call for starting with the uh, presentation of our keynote speaker, Driss El Adani. I must say that none of us would be here today if Driss was not here, because he was the one who organized, with the help of some others, but uh, he was the one to uh, uh, organize everything, and he is the uh, Director General of the uh, Royal Center for Remote Sensing. As the Minister said this morning, this is an institution that has already almost 30 years, so uh, this shows the investment in space uh, from uh, Morocco, not only from Morocco, but also uh, for, for Morocco, of course, but also for the entire African region. And I will leave the floor to Dries Eladani. Dries. Merci, Jean-Pascal, pour cette introduction. Je tiens à remercier le comité de programme de m'avoir donné l'opportunité de m'adresser donc euh, avec euh, cette keynote à cette première planière. Dans cette euh, introduction, dans cette présentation introductive, euh, je vais partager avec vous quelques idées et quelques réflexions autour de la question pourquoi les pays émergents doivent-ils investir dans l'espace Je dirais même d'une façon beaucoup plus générale, pourquoi ils doivent-ils investir l'espace L'objectif étant d'apporter une contribution au thème retenu pour la conférence, à savoir combler le gap spatial pour les pays émergents. Euh, je vais commencer par rappeler un peu le contexte global donc, des secteurs spatials d'une façon générale, souligner un peu quelques tendances qui peuvent présenter parfois des opportunités pour les pays émergents, parfois également quelques challenges et défis que ces pays émergents doivent affronter et relever pour pouvoir mettre en place des programmes spatiaux. Dans ce long parcours, l'humanité a passé par un certain nombre d'étapes de développement et la conquête de l'espace constitue quand même une avancée qualitative et un point d'inflexion très important pour euh, le progrès de l'humanité puisque cette, euh, ce changement majeur a bouleversé pas uniquement les équilibres géostratégiques mais également les modes de vie, les modes de gestion des ressources naturelles, les modes de fonctionnement d'une façon générale, et donc et du développement. En effet, depuis le, le milieu des années 60, les, acti les activités spatiales ont connu une expansion et un développement constant pour devenir indispensables à la vie moderne, indispensables aux télécommunications, indispensables à la gestion des ressources, des ressources naturelles, indispensable quelque part également à la gestion du territoire national, la gestion des catastrophes, finalement c'est quand même quelque chose qui est devenu central dans l'activité au quotidien, au niveau euh, global. Et donc pratiquement tous les acteurs économiques, quels que soient les domaines, utilisent et utiliseront davantage dans les années à venir les technologies spatiales pour euh, leurs euh, programmes, pour leurs projets, qu'il s'agisse de l'observation de la Terre, des télécommunications, de la navigation, du positionnement, etc. Et donc ce secteur aujourd'hui, comme ça a été dit dans, ce matin lors des, des différents discours d'ouverture, connaît donc des changements très profonds qui sont sous-tendus par des, des tendances majeures, comme j'ai dit tout à l'heure, qui sont parfois des opportunités, mais parfois également des challenges que ces pays doivent, doivent soulever. La première, ou le premier constat qu'on peut faire à ce niveau-là, c'est que la, la globalisation du secteur spatial s'accélère à un rythme très, très important. Donc, euh, si on regarde, par exemple, il y a quelques années, au milieu des années 90, au début des années 90, il y avait pas plus que 15 pays qui avaient des programmes spatiaux d'une façon ou d'une autre. Donc, euh, ce qui restait quand même à l'époque un, un, un club rel relativement restreint, motivé au départ par des considérations beaucoup plus géopolitiques, etc., alors qu'au fur et à mesure, on constate qu'il y a un, une évolution, une globalisation, un élargissement 
les États qui utilisent les, les, études, les technologies spatiales, au milieu des années 2000, donc il y avait pratiquement une vingtaine, une trentaine pardon, de pays qui avaient des programmes spatiaux dans différentes régions, alors que on, à partir de 2013, on constate qu'il y a une accélération très importante dans ce domaine pour atteindre aujourd'hui pratiquement, pratiquement une centaine de pays qui ont des programmes spatiaux dans différents domaines, que ce soit de la Terre, des télécommunications, etc. Ce qui témoigne bien sûr que donc, cette tendance de globalisation est une tendance très importante et qui euh, traduit la, la volonté d'un grand nombre de pays d'investir dans ce domaine. La deuxième tendance, c'est que cet investissement, il est justifié quelque part par une, une perception de plus en plus positive, de plus en plus croissante, comme quoi l'espace, c'est un outil, c'est un levier utile pour pratiquement tous les domaines de développement. Donc, il y a autour de cette perception positive, si on peut dire, de l'utilité de l'espace, quatre ou cinq axes qu'il va falloir un peu noter. Le premier, c'est que pour un nombre de pays, le spatial est considéré comme étant un moyen de prestige et ça confère un, un avantage politique, un avantage euh, géostratégique dans certains cas. Et donc, c'est quand même quelque chose de très important qui euh, peut être derrière la décision d'un certain nombre de pays de pouvoir investir dans le domaine spatial. Donc, l'espace le, est perçu toujours, malgré cette évolution technologique, comme étant un outil, un levier de prestige national, mais également de capacité ou de position géostratégique sur le plan régional et international. Et il est bien évident aujourd'hui, quand on regarde un peu le chiquet international, que les pays qui développent des programmes spatiaux sont considérés comme étant, ayant une position particulière et un rôle un peu particulier au niveau international. Le deuxième élément dans cette perception positive de l'espace, c'est que il est aujourd'hui clair et net que les bénéfices et le retombé socio-économiques de l'espace sont, sont évidents, sont nombreux, sont très diversifiés. Et donc, il n'y a, a plus besoin de faire la démonstration que ces technologies ont des retombées. Donc, euh, comme j'ai dit, sur pratiquement tous les secteurs, on peut citer à, à, à titre d'exemple le travail qui a été fait par euh, le groupe Géo il y a quelques années, Group on Earth Observation, et qui a identifié pratiquement neuf secteurs ou domaines sociétals où l'observation de la Terre en particulier joue un rôle déterminant pour euh, le développement, que ce soit la gestion des ressources en eau, que ce soit la gestion des catastrophes, l'énergie, le développement durable, etc. Un autre exemple pour justifier quand même cette perception, par exemple, si on prend euh, le cas du programme satellite indien en matière de météorologie, donc euh, il y a un programme qui a été lancé et qui a permis quand même de, de, de sauver des milliers et des milliers de, 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 de vies grâce à l'observation satellite en 2013, alors que le même phénomène climatologique ou météorologique, en, quelques années plus tard, en, en 1999, avait causé la mort de plus de 10 000 personnes. Donc rien que ça, par exemple, comme retombée de l'espace sur le plan de développement socio-économique, n'a pas de, 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 je dirais, de valeur en termes de démonstration. Là, je partage avec vous un extrait d'une étude qui a été réalisée par l'Union européenne sur les les effets bénéfiques de l'espace en listant un certain nombre de domaines qui vont de la météorologie en passant par la gestion des risques, la, la, la défense, les changements climatiques, l'agriculture, etc. Et à chaque fois, la démonstration a été faite comme quoi c'est un outil qui permet soit d'améliorer des process qui existent, soit de faire des économies très importantes sur la, la, la gestion des ressources ou la sauvegarde de ressources. Au-delà de ces bénéfices sociétaux qui sont parfois euh, difficiles, si on peut dire, à quantifier sur le plan économique, le, la perception de l'espace comme étant un outil très important et utile réside également dans son, son, son impact et son importance économique. Et donc, euh, on peut éventuellement citer un certain nombre de, je dirais, de points qui permettent de démontrer que sur le plan économique, les ressources ou les technologies spatiales, les programmes spatiaux apportent quand même une contribution très importante, soit en termes de réduction de coûts, donc sur certaines choses, on les fait, fait d'une façon beaucoup plus efficace et beaucoup plus efficiente, soit en produisant, en offrant des services et des produits qui permettent de mieux réaliser des projets, soit en créant des dynamiques entre plusieurs secteurs, parce qu'on le sait, l'espace est un outil fédérateur qui met en jeu plusieurs acteurs, on l'a dit tout à l'heure, on l'a montré sur la partie réduction des coûts 
sur certaines opérations. Et bien sûr, d'une façon beaucoup plus générale, c'est une meilleure gestion des ressources environnementales, c'est une meilleure façon de pouvoir délivrer ou livrer des services de soins pour les populations, des, des, des services d'éducation, des services de gestion, etc. Donc, euh, il y a une étude qui a été réalisée par le CDE en 2014 et qui a essayé de synthétiser un peu ces aspects. Donc, ça, ça regroupe un impact sur le plan commercial mettant en jeu des, des industriels et des solutions innovantes, également un impact sur la productivité et l'efficacité, plus éventuellement tout ce qui est euh, réduction des coûts et, et évitement éventuellement de dépenses inutiles. Euh, un autre exemple pour illustrer l'impact économique des technologies spatiales, donc ça également c'est une comparaison qui a été réalisée par le CE2 en 2014 sur par exemple un euro investi dans l'espace, qu'est-ce qu'il génère comme ressources sur l'économie on a par exemple le cas de la Belgique, avec un euro investi, on génère pratiquement un euro, un euro et demi en termes de, de ressources sur l'activité économique. Remarque sur ce tableau, par exemple, le cas du Danemark, de Norvège, etc., que le, le ratio est vraiment très élevé. Et c'est des pays qui ont beaucoup investi dans des domaines liés à l'espace, mais pas nécessairement dans la, la mise en orbite de satellites ou l'investissement dans des, des infrastructures lourdes, mais beaucoup plus dans des, des activités de services ou, ou de soutien. Donc, ce qui démontre quand même que l'activité la, 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 spatiale a un fort potentiel économique. Ceci également est très visible, si on prendra un peu les, les chiffres qui, qui sont produits à l'échelle internationale en matière de volume de cette activité. S'il y a quelques années, par exemple, en, en 2005, l'activité économique spatiale globale était de l'ordre de 175 milliards de dollars, il a atteint en 2005 euh, quelque chose comme, euh, pardon, il a atteint en 2016 quelque chose comme 345 pour atteindre aujourd'hui en 2017 quelque chose comme 385 milliards de dollars comme activité globale. Et donc, malgré la crise économique qui a, qui a, qui a touché l'économie mondiale, le secteur spatial quand même a, a gardé une certaine résilience dans ce domaine et a gardé un rythme de croissance qui était globalement de l'ordre de trois fois supérieur au taux de croissance du BIP sur le, à l'échelle mondiale entre, 2000, entre 1995 et 2015. Donc ceci démontre, si besoin est, que l'activité spatiale est un grand facteur de développement économique. Cette tendance va encore s'accélérer dans les années à venir, selon certaines études qui ont été réalisées par, par notamment des banques américaines. Donc on a des tendances qui vont jusqu'à 1,7 milliard en termes de, 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 de croissance, qui représente à peu près cinq fois le volume actuel, il y a d'autres estimations qui tablent sur une croissance qui peut atteindre jusqu'à 3, 3 000 milliards de dollars pardon, en 2040. Ce qui veut dire que le potentiel de développement pour les 20 années à venir est énorme dans ce domaine. Maintenant, sur le plan global, si on regarde un peu la chaîne de valeur spatiale, donc, les experts la, la, la composent de trois grandes parties, le upstream, toute la partie liée à, aux infrastructures spatiales, etc. La partie midstream, la partie euh, concernant l'opération de satellites, l'utilisation de ressources, etc. Mais le gros réside dans le, le downstream, donc euh, l'activité en, en, en aval qui, qui permet de, 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 de générer beaucoup de ressources et qui est beaucoup plus accessible donc, à, à, à beaucoup de pays émergents et qui représente un potentiel très important de développement. À titre d'exemple, si, si on peut un peu illustrer ça, donc si on prend le cas par exemple de Satellite Applications Catapult, c'est un incubateur euh, de l'agence spatiale britannique, donc qui a concentré ses efforts sur des domaines innovants tels que le transport par exemple, tels que les véhicules autonomes, etc., parce qu'il y a un fort potentiel de développement en utilisant les, les, les techniques spatiales dans ces domaines. Autre domaine qui présente un potentiel très important qui a été également euh, choisi par, par, par cet incubateur, c'est toute l'économie bleue, donc tout ce qu'on peut faire en matière de développement de ressources océaniques sur la base de l'exploitation des ressources spatiales et des, des, des technologies spatiales. Donc ça, c'est un peu, le, les, les, je dirais, les retombées, les retombées directes de l'espace. On peut également regarder un peu du côté des spin-offs, et là, il y a un énorme potentiel qui est très important, qui peut éventuellement constituer un levier de développement pour les pays émergents, pour bénéficier d'une expertise et du savoir-faire dans ce domaine. Deuxième exemple, c'est la politique qui a été mise en place 
par euh, l'Agence spatiale européenne à travers les, 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 les incubateurs d'innovation qui sont dédiés à, à, à renforcer les capacités, à ouvrir donc, euh, les, les innovations et technologies spatiales à d'autres applications indirectes de l'espace et ça représente un fort potentiel et encore une fois, c'est une, une, une tendance qui est très importante dans ce domaine et qui peut présenter pour les pays émergents donc un levier et un, et un axe de développement très important. Dernier point concernant donc cette perception positive de l'espace comme étant quelque chose de vraiment très important pour le développement, c'est le, le, le potentiel commercial, si on peut dire. Et donc là, et depuis quelques années, on voit qu'il y a beaucoup d'investisseurs, beaucoup d'acteurs économiques qui ne sont pas nécessairement les gouvernements et les États, mais des acteurs privés qui investissent dans le domaine spatial et qui, qui, parce qu'il y a un fort potentiel de développement à ce niveau-là. Deuxième ou troisième élément de tendance, la globalisation dans un premier temps. Deuxième élément, c'est cette perception positive avec ses, ses composantes en termes de prestige, en termes de bénéfices, en termes de développement économique et en termes de profitabilité commerciale. La troisième tendance, c'est la maturité aujourd'hui des technologies spatiales et la baisse des coûts. Ça constitue deux éléments très importants qui euh, contribuent à une conjoncture favorable pour pouvoir inciter, pousser les pays émergents à développer leurs ressources, à développer leurs programmes et à mettre en place des infrastructures et également des projets spatiaux dans ce domaine. Donc cette, euh, cette maturité se manifeste à travers deux aspects très importants. D'une part, c'est un peu, je dirais, entre parenthèses, la banalisation, en quelque sorte, des, 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 des composants techniques qui peuvent entrer dans ce domaine, dont toutes les avancées, toutes les, tous les progrès réalisés en matière des technologies de l'information et de communication, du développement informatique, etc. Tout ça, aujourd'hui, peut facilement être mis, mis en valeur dans des programmes spatiaux. Et également, un deuxième, un deuxième élément dans cette tendance, c'est cette euh, avancée réalisée en matière de miniaturisation, les avancées également en termes de, de ressources et, 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 et de matériaux qui sont utilisés, les technologies d'impression 3D, etc., toutes ces avancées-là font qu'aujourd'hui, le spatial est considéré comme étant quelque chose qui est beaucoup plus accessible et avec des coûts qui sont nettement beaucoup plus réduits par rapport à ce qui, à ce qui était il y, a, il y a quelques années. Et on, on, on sent cette tendance, ou, ou les retombées de cette tendance, ou les conséquences de cette tendance sur le développement, euh, je dirais, très très rapide et très structuré de, tout, de toute l'activité mini-satellite aujourd'hui qui commence à, 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 à occuper un peu le, le, le domaine spatial. Nous avons, à titre d'exemple, dans le domaine de l'observation de la Terre, l'expérience Planet Lab qui a mis en orbite pratiquement 300 petits satellites et qui assure aujourd'hui une couverture mondiale donc, euh, pratiquement quotidienne. Sur le plan de télécommunication, le récent projet de euh, OneWeb qui veut mettre en place quand même quelque chose comme 600 satellites autour de la Terre pour pouvoir assurer l'accès à Internet, faciliter les communications, donc ce qui démontre que, effectivement, donc cette, cette maturité de l'espace et ce, ce virement vers la miniaturisation constitue quand même un avantage très important pour euh, offrir aux pays émergents la possibilité de pouvoir euh, accéder à ce, à, ce, à ce domaine. Quatrième tendance, c'est un peu quelques changements en termes de politique nationale, et je veux dire par là deux aspects. Le premier, c'est toute la partie contrôle des exportations en lien avec les technologies spatiales. C'est vrai que c'est encore très timide, c'est encore euh, à ses débuts, mais on constate qu'il y a un, une, 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 une sorte d'assouplissement qui s'opère. Il y a une volonté, effectivement, de pouvoir rendre cette technologie beaucoup plus accessible, et donc ça constitue une opportunité dans ce domaine. La deuxième composante, effectivement, de ce changement de politique nationale, c'est la volonté qui est manifestée par plusieurs pays de pouvoir dynamiser leur secteur industriel interne, de pouvoir créer une dynamique dans ce domaine et de favoriser l'émergence de start-up, favoriser l'émergence de sociétés innovantes dans ce domaine. Donc ces changements-là, effectivement, donc, permettent aux pays donc, émergents, comme je l'ai dit, d'avoir relativement, d'une façon plus facile, accès aux technologies spatiales, vu cette, cette relative assouplissement donc, pour le, ce relatif assouplissement des, des politiques nationales en matière d'export liées aux technologies spatiales, et également donc, les programmes de promotion et, et, et de soutien au développement des, des, des start-up et, et, et des acteurs privés. 
Cinquième tendance, effectivement, donc ça c'est un constat beaucoup plus qu'autre chose, c'est que le spatial aujourd'hui est l'un des meilleurs outils pour pouvoir faire face aux changements, aux challenges, si on peut dire, aux défis globaux que, 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 nous, que, nous, que, nous, que nous affrontons tous à l'échelle globale. C'est pratiquement le, le meilleur outil en matière de lutte contre les changements climatiques, en matière de gestion des ressources naturelles, en matière de développement. Et ça a été dit plusieurs fois dans plusieurs conférences que, par exemple, en matière de collecte d'informations pour les changements climatiques sur les soixantaines de paramètres qui sont nécessaires pour pouvoir mettre en place les programmes et pouvoir réaliser donc les, les, les projets de, 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 des changements climatiques. Il y a pratiquement 25 à 26 qui sont disponibles uniquement par et à travers les moyens d'observation, à travers les moyens spatiaux. Donc là, c'est également donc quelque chose de très important. Sixième tendance dans ce domaine, c'est l'espace, c'est la technologie spatiale, c'est un outil qui permet non seulement de réaliser donc, euh, des, des avancées sur le développement socio-économique, mais également c'est un moyen de pouvoir créer cette, euh, cette transition vers l'économie digi digitale, vers l'économie numérique. Donc l'infrastructure spatiale, les pays qui arrivent à maîtriser donc, ces, ces technologies, qui arrivent à mieux pouvoir faire lié aux technologies spatiales, ils ont également une opportunité de pouvoir participer aux changements nécessaires de leurs économies, de leurs structures industrielles, pour pouvoir la faire émerger donc vers la, 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 les, nouvelles, les, nouvelles, comment dire, les nouvelles tendances économiques, notamment en matière de digitalisation et du numérique. Et vous avez tout à l'heure remarqué le discours du ministre de l'Industrie et du Commerce qui accorde une importance particulière donc à ce domaine, le considérant comme étant un levier pour la transformation économique du pays. Par rapport à ces tendances qui sont, qui sont donc autant d'éléments favorables, autant d'éléments qui ouvre des opportunités pour le pays, en même temps un certain nombre de défis et de challenges que notamment les pays émergents doivent affronter, doivent relever pour pouvoir asseoir des programmes spatiaux, pour pouvoir réussir dans leur, dans, leur, dans leur politique spatiale. Le premier challenge, à mon avis, c'est qu'il n'y a pas aujourd'hui un modèle global qu'on peut facilement appliquer partout. Donc il faut que ces pays soient capables de créer leur propre business model en matière de, de spatial. Et là, effectivement, il y a plusieurs expériences qu'on peut, qu peut, qu peut présenter. J'espère que les débats pendant les panels d'aujourd'hui de, de et demain vont permettre également de partager des expériences dans ce domaine. Mais l'un des challenges pour les pays émergents, c'est de pouvoir créer leur propre modèle. Il n'est pas nécessaire, et parfois ce n'est pas possible de pouvoir investir dans des, des infrastructures lourdes, dans des projets structurants, mais qui sont, qui sont, qui sont très, très demandeurs ou très consommateurs en matière de ressources. Mais il est possible, comme on vient de le dire par exemple, en se concentrant sur la, le, le segment downstream, de pouvoir bénéficier de l'espace et de pouvoir en tirer le maximum de bénéfices. Donc, l'un des challenges que ces pays doivent affronter, c'est de créer leur propre modèle pour pouvoir tenir compte de leur, de leur spécificité, tenir compte de leurs ressources, de leurs contraintes pour pouvoir mettre en place un programme spatial. Le deuxième challenge, c'est que... Euh, avec la compétition commerciale, avec le développement de l'activité commerciale, avec l'émergence des acteurs animés par une, une vocation commerciale, donc les pays émergents sont affrontés à un dilemme pour savoir où placer le, le curseur, en quelque sorte, entre l'activité qui doit être une activité chapeautée, conduite et contrôlée par les gouvernements, et une activité spatiale qui peut également être pilotée, réalisée par des acteurs privés, par des acteurs euh, euh, commerciaux. Donc là, effectivement, c'est un challenge pour que les pays soient, savent exactement à quel moment il va falloir mettre le, le, le partage et le, le, le bon mix entre l'activité gérée par les, les acteurs gouvernementaux et l'activité sous la, la, la conduite des acteurs commerciaux et privés. Troisième challenge également, c'est que euh, traditionnellement, l'espace était une activité, une politique qui était managée top-down avec cette émergence des acteurs commerciaux, avec cette globalisation dont on vient de parler au début, avec ces frontières qui commencent effectivement à, à tomber graduellement, il devient de plus en plus difficile pour les pays émergents d'avoir un management top-down 100% sur ces activités. Donc il y a lieu également de prendre en considération donc, cette, cette nouvelle conjoncture en matière d'acteurs, en matière de distribution de rôles, pour pouvoir mettre en place une politique spatiale, un cadre réglementaire, qui tiendrait compte donc de, cette, de ce challenge. Donc la difficulté de pouvoir continuer à manager l'espace d'une façon verticale, mais de tenir compte également de cette diversité des acteurs et cette complexité en termes d'acteurs. De, de,
quatrième challenge, c'est un peu d'une façon globale et pas uniquement pour les pays émergents, on constate qu'il y a quand même un, 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 une sorte de déséquilibre ou un déclin de ce contrôle qui était entre les mains de quelques pays. Donc on voit émerger de nouvelles forces, on voit émerger de, de nouvelles puissances sur la, le management et sur l'activité spatiale internationale. Pour euh, un peu conclure ma présentation, je vais terminer par souligner trois éléments qui me semblent important, essentiel pour mettre en place une stratégie, une politique spatiale pour un pays émergent, c'est autour de trois piliers. Le premier pilier, c'est la partie ressources. Parce que on sait tous que les programmes spatiaux observés d'une façon traditionnelle ou pris un peu dans le contexte historique, c'est des programmes qui sont très consommateurs en ressources. Donc, le vrai challenge que les pays émergents doivent relever en matière de, de, de mise en place de programmes spatiaux, c'est de pouvoir mobiliser les ressources naturelles, les ressources financières nécessaires pour ce genre de choses, être capable de tenir ce, cette mobilisation sur le long terme, parce que ce n'est pas des programmes euh, d'un one shot, si on peut dire, mais c'est des programmes qui s'échelonnent dans le temps. Et donc le premier challenge, c'est d'être en mesure de pouvoir mobiliser les ressources. Et je pense là encore aujourd'hui, il y a d'autres mécanismes ou d'autres schémas qu'on peut mettre en place sous forme de partenariat. Part public privé, se forme de soutien, par exemple, d'organismes de bailleurs de fonds qui peuvent commencer à s'intéresser à ce domaine, à tenir les pays dans, dans, dans ce secteur. Le deuxième pilier, c'est la partie capabilities. En quelque sorte, quel secteur, quel composant, quelle niche, on peut dire, ces pays, développement, ces pays émergents doivent choisir pour pouvoir construire leur programme spatial, parce que là, effectivement, le champ est vraiment très large et la concurrence également est très, très importante à ce niveau-là. Et il y a lieu de pouvoir bien choisir donc, le secteur où on veut développer ses capacités en matière de... de, de, de L'exemple, par exemple, qui, qui revient souvent dans, dans, dans la littérature internationale, c'est par exemple le choix qui a été fait par le Canada à un certain moment de développer le bras, qui est aujourd'hui un, un élément très important, essentiel dans la station spatiale internationale. Et ça leur a donné un avantage technologique et concurrentiel très important. Troisième et dernier pilier, c'est la question de la gouvernance. Bon, parce qu'effectivement... C'est un secteur spécifique avec un certain nombre de contraintes, avec un certain nombre de, je dirais de, de, de mécanismes de gestion et de fonctionnement qui sont totalement différents de ce qu'on a l'habitude de voir dans d'autres secteurs. Et donc la question de la gouvernance est une question centrale dans tout programme et projet spatial, notamment pour les pays émergents. Et donc, euh, comme vous l'avez remarqué dans le programme, on a toute une séance, une plénière, donc le vendredi, sur la, la partie policy et, et, et cadre juridique. Et je pense que c'est un, un aspect très important et qui peut être déterminant pour le succès d'un programme spatial. Donc voilà d'une façon globale quelques éléments et quelques idées que je voulais partager avec vous donc, comme introduction à ce débat. Et donc euh, je reste à votre disposition pour développer davantage quelques éléments à travers les questions-réponses. Merci. Thank you, Doris, for this uh, very comprehensive uh, introduction, and uh, I'm sure there is a lot of food for thought. Could the uh, distinguished panelists be kind enough to come and sit in the uh, in the uh, on the stage, so that we can start the uh, conversation? So I will, I will introduce, of course, each panelist, but uh, since we have a, a very important <coughs> panel, I think it would be better to introduce them one by one and give them 
a chance to uh, make uh, a small introductory remark before we start the conversation. So the first uh, to speak will be uh, Mohamed El uh, Ababi. Um, uh, he is the man of many firsts because he is the first Director General of the uh, UAESA uh, and the uh, UAE uh, Space Agency has a very uh, big uh, space program, which I'm sure he will, uh, he will comment on, with uh, a first uh, mission to Mars uh, from uh, coming from uh, an emerging country in the field of space activities. And his country is, will also be the first country to host IAF only after a few years of uh, membership. So. Uh, is a very, uh, I think the, the UAE is a very good example of all the ambitions that the space program can give to the newcomers. And I think we have many, many things to learn from his experience. And this is why we will hear from him. Uh, thank you, Pascal. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity and um, uh, start thanking uh, you know, the organizers, uh, IAF and uh, the Royal Center of uh, Remote Sensing, uh, specifically uh, Dr. Dries. Uh, and also, I would like to uh, give you uh, an overview uh, on UAE space program as we learn from uh, His Excellency uh, Dr. Dries on the benefits of space, uh, especially for emerging uh, uh, countries. Uh, UAE long time ago has identified space as a uh, part of its present and the future uh, due to the benefits uh, strategically, economically, science, and also more importantly, inspiring. Uh, we are using space in UAE to inspire young people. As you might know that uh, two thirds of uh, the Middle East population are under 25 years old. So uh, space is a key and a tool to inspire them for a better future. Uh, we think that in UAE space agency and UAE space program, uh, we have significant um, uh, regional capability. Uh, we have uh, uh, 10 satellites in orbit, uh, eight in uh, projects. Uh, we have the first Arab and Islamic uh, mission to Mars, uh, a mission, a science mission that will fly next year by July. Uh, it's called uh, the Hope, uh, which is in Arabic, uh, Al Amal. This is just to inspire young people in our region for a better future. Uh, we have an astronaut program. Uh, first, UAE astronaut will fly to the International Space Station this September. Uh, we um, conducted, just to show you the benefits of how space is uh, inspiring people, when we uh, open uh, you know, the astronaut program for people to apply. Uh, 4,000 people applied for the uh, program. One third are women, so you can imagine that uh, part of the Middle East, small country, one third of the applicants uh, are women. We also uh, have regulated the space sector, so we issued national space policy strategy and law. Uh, we have around 1,500 people who are working in the sector, uh, 1,550 uh, uh, companies working in UAE and the space activities. Uh, the amount of the investment in the space activities exceeds six billion dollars so far. Uh, we recently uh, managed to group with the 11 Arab countries to establish uh, the Arab Space Cooperation Group, which is a kind of uh, uh, a body that will uh, promote space in the Arab region. Uh, this is, of course, with the support from uh, uh, Morocco as well and Egypt and Saudi Arabia. The 11 countries uh, decided to have the headquarter in UAE and uh, the group will promote uh, space activities and UAE government on that occasion uh, donated a remote sensing satellite to serve you know, the Arab region uh, in the area of remote sensing and climate change and environment uh, monitoring. We are proud of what we try to do for the region and we are happy to share our experience but also more importantly to learn from advanced nations in that space uh, you know, activities. I think this is a, just 
quick an overview, and I think I will pass back to uh, Basta. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alababi. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Pascal Erhan Freund. She is a, a researcher in astrobiology, and she's also a chairman of the uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, research centers in, in Europe, uh, dealing also with space activities, but not only with space activities. She is the uh, IAF in incoming president, as, as it was recorded this morning. And if there was an award uh, for the most powerful uh, woman in space, I think Pascal would obviously get it. <laughs> Please. Well, that's, that's very kind of Pascal. I have to press, it's very kind of Pascal. Yeah, um, yeah uh, thank you also uh, uh, for in inviting um, uh, DLR and, and, and me to this panel. I think we had a very great keynote, uh, which showed us how dynamic the space sector is, uh, how uh, many countries have joined, how many countries have satellites. Uh, um, and um, I think we have to, we are here in these next three days in order to discuss how emerging countries uh, can uh, find uh, more or less uh, their place uh, in this dynamic space sector. And uh, as Jean Pascal said, the German Aerospace Center is one of the largest research organizations uh, in Europe for space and aeronautics, but also for energy, transport, uh, security, and digitalization. And I want to come back to that because um, we have seen that there are a lot of um, activities from space which have socioeconomic benefits uh, uh, for other areas. And it is this connection between the space sector and the non-space sector and, uh, and other important research areas, which uh, I think leads us uh, to solve or uh, deliver contributions to uh, uh, solve uh, global challenges. So um, I, I just want to highlight a, a few uh, aspects um, uh, of the German Aerospace Center, how we actually contribute uh, and help also emerging countries uh, to, um, with uh, space solutions and also involve them uh, in, 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 in their future prospects. So uh, there's one project, uh, the EO Atlas Africa, which is an Earth observation project of the German Aerospace Center, which provides uh, consistent information on global change var variables uh, for the African continent. And uh, this is in order to provide insights uh, on uh, current and uh, past vegetation conditions, um, uh, drought indicators, extent and dynamics of uh, water bodies, and also urbanization uh, in Africa. And using this variety of data sets, I think it is important, uh, 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 it brings important understanding and also uh, for measuring global changes here in, in Africa. And uh, because we also mentioned about the business models and spin-offs spin and spillovers, you know, from the space sector, uh, we are actually here active in, in Morocco, uh, uh, helping um, uh, linking space technologies to other areas of socioeconomic benefits, namely to renewable energies. And uh, so in recent years, DLR uh, has projects here in the regions which use high spatial, um, uh, high resolution spatial data to optimize renewable energy system. This means in order to find out with uh, Earth observation, but also with meteorological data, where actually to place solar power plants. It's a project called N Nermina, and it's also uh, uh, here uh, with um, 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 agencies and also with universities here in Morocco. So I, I want to close by saying that uh, I think we um, um, evolved research organizations, agencies, space agencies uh, have actually a lot of power in order to uh, teach about space applications um, and technologies 
uh, to emerging countries and also tell them uh, where to invest and uh, what is actually important for them. And I think this is something what we are going to discuss in the next three days. Thank you, Pascal. And now the floor goes to uh, Sergei Saveliev. He's Deputy Director General of the uh, Roscosmos uh, State uh, Space Corporation. And uh, of course, uh, Russia has done uh, fantastic achievements uh, and has a fantastic know-how in, in space activities. So it is a great honor and a great pleasure to have you here today to share a little bit of uh, your experience in all the fields of uh, space activities where Russia is so keen of. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean Pascal. Dear colleagues, the Russian Federation has a fully developed economic, scientific, technologic, and intellectual potential enabling us to develop and act in all space activity sectors. Together with the national security-related issues, applied use of space technologies for the benefit of socio-economic development is one of the priorities for the state space corporation Roscosmos, englobing 77 organizations in space industry and the research and development in Russia. A few words about our capacity and how they could bring benefits to the emerging space nations. Through the development of our domestic ground space infrastructure and launch vehicles, we are capable to launch a wide range of payloads from smallest CubeSats to habitable modules of orbital stations into any orbit the customer needs. Low Earth, high elliptical, geostationary, or for the interplanetary mission. This payload can be primary or secondary. And the case of a secondary payload uh, is an attractive solution for low budget projects of relevance for developing countries, like governmental, small sats, universities, satellite teams, uh, startups, and so on. Currently, we have uh, 91 operational satellites and space modules orbiting around the Earth, performing the multi uh, multitude of tasks for civil use. Uh, with the advent of digital era, our logic task is to create global seamless informational field, covering with communication services even most remote territories where landlines do not exist. We build satellites for public, private, and foreign customers, from mobile personal communications like GoNet systems to data relay LUCH and wideband telecoms like Express. We believe that filling the gap on the digital disparity is a main task in the field of telecoms both for us as governmental space agencies and respective governmental bodies in developing countries. Also, Russia has an operational global navigation satellite system, GLONASS, which plays a very important role in the national economy development. It covers monitoring of automobile transportation, driverless mining cars, high precision agriculture, safety of air and maritime transport as well as control of critical infrastructure objects, like power stations, pipes, electric lines, or bridges. Another very important area is the development and use of the Earth observation system. The State Space Corporation of Cosmos is expanding national remote sensing satellite constellation, including optical and radar satellites on sun synchronous, high elliptic, and geostationary orbits. Data from these satellites cover a full range of applied users from cartography, monitoring forest and water resources, predicting weather up to countering natural and human-made disasters, as well as preventing ecologic crimes like oil spills, illegal logging, and uh, waste dumps. All these topics are of essential interest for any country in the world. But nowadays, it is obvious that this kind of activities can be performed with efficiency only with space data. Last but not least uh, is the human space flights. With the diversifi uh, diversification of human space flight programs worldwide, we see more uh, opportunities for developing countries to participate in the scientific and applied use research 
it was the Russian segment of the International Space Station. I would like to say, welcome aboard. We will give you all necessary assistance in training your astronauts and preparing experiments in the space. To summarize, I would like to underline that Roscosmos is open for cooperation in two main modes. We are able to provide emerging space users with a ready for use products and services tailored in accordance with its customer needs. Also, also, we are ready to assist our partners in establishing national space programs and developing domestic space sector through exchange of technologies and know-how, training of specialists and enhancing local industrial capabilities. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sergei. The, the next speaker is at the same time the most uh, easy to introduce and the most difficult one to introduce. He is easy to introduce because he is very well known. He is uh, Jean-Yves Le Gall, he is the uh, president of the IAF. He is the president of the uh, uh, Galileo Security Agency. He is the uh, president of the ISA Council. And he is also the president of CNES, and this is why he is difficult to introduce for me, because he is my boss. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Jean Pascal. But uh, I would quote uh, Trotsky, who said, uh, I am uh, his boss, so I have to obey him. So I'm going <laughs> to obey him. Uh, as I said in my uh, introductory uh, speech, uh, the very fact that this uh, global uh, conference on space for 19 countries is taking place uh, today with uh, so many high-level attendees uh, from established uh, spacefaring nations uh, as well as uh, newcomers. In fact, this is uh, what I would call a fantastic uh, testament uh, to space democracy. Because uh, the international space scene is moving away from a very uh, exclusive club it has been for decades, and it is becoming uh, today a multipolar arena. Thanks to the decreasing cost of access to space, virtually every country in the world can now benefit from space applications. And uh, every year, we see that the number of countries establishing space agencies, launching satellites, or fully integrating the space data into their public policies, this number is increasing. A very striking factor in this wave of space democratization is that nations are investing in space for the direct benefit of their citizens. Space applications are perceived as a powerful tool for social and economic development, and much more than a mere instrument of political prestige. The consequence of this trend is that international cooperation in space is becoming more important than ever. This is uh, especially true between established spacefaring players, such as France and newcomers. Not only do we have a responsibility to share the benefits of space as widely as possible, but we can also gain a lot from these uh, new concepts of cooperation, gaining insight into innovative ways of working. And uh, as president of CNES, I can assure you that the broad diversification of international partners I initiated is based on a real win-win analysis. We share our expertise, but we also gain a lot of knowledge in return. And so, in a nutshell, I think that uh, this conference uh, for these three days in Marrakesh it is a perfect illustration of what a space should be, a domain serving all humankind aimed at delivering tangible benefits on earthly policies. And in that sense, I'm very much looking forward to the discussion in this panel, which will for sure illustrate these ideas more concretely. So thank you. I think that uh, now we have to discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Jai. The, um, uh, 
next speaker is uh, Chris Lee, the uh, chief scientist of the uh, UK Space Agency. UK Space Agency is a very interesting agency uh, because uh, uh, the positioning of the uh, UK Space Agency is quite original in the, in the field of the uh, established uh, space powers. Uh, the, the, this positioning will be, of course, uh, explained better than I could do by, by Chris. And I think it is very relevant to hear from him uh, today. Thank you. <coughs> thanks very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. First of all, let me take this opportunity to thank the committee for inviting me to present on behalf of the UK Space Agency. As you will have gathered, uh, I'm not a head of a space agency like many of my colleagues here, um, but I, d I have the honor of designing and running perhaps one of the largest programs in the world that is looking at how space is used for sustainable development in emerging economies, and I'd like to share some thoughts with you uh, over the next three days. Space uh, may appear to many outside this room to be all about astronauts, the moon, certainly recently with the headlines, rockets and perhaps even to some of them Star Trek. But over many years and in quiet ways, uh, space-based satellites have reshaped the world's socio-economic structure. And Driss mentioned that eloquently today in his keynote presentation. Meteorology, navigation, telecommunications do not make headlines, but they are certainly making the world tick today. Space exploration may capture the public imagination, but it is the application of satellite data that surely counts to governments who generally have to fund these very complicated and expensive programs. The, the, the development of a sustainable national policy on food production or coastal fisheries or forestry or regional education, health and tax revenue, many more can all be delivered strategically through the use of satellite data. And understanding how this can work should surely underpin any national space program that may be in planning. We in the UK, we give this a name, we call it Space for Smarter Government. Yet despite this, space has had a checkered history, including with the UN itself. For many years, capabilities of space have been oversold and the technology has simply not been available to deliver sustainable impact beyond the operational phases. Space effectively has not been able to demonstrate, except a few exceptions, that it can be truly operational. But as Jean-Yves recalled this morning, we're now benefiting from the digital revolution, and this is transforming the role that space can play. But not only space, we are now seeing smarter ground-based sensors. We're seeing smarter computing networks. We're seeing the use of smartphones as ways to gather and deliver information to citizens. And of course, we now have smarter satellites. We therefore in the UK wanted to emphasize the approach where space and development could harness these developments, not based around the promotion of technology, but perhaps on the delivery of measurable benefits. And so the UK Space Agency established what has been called the International Partnership Program and as I said, it's a very large program, perhaps one of the largest. It's a five-year program spending over 150 million pounds, which we use to bring together research and innovation from around the world to deliver sustainable economic or societal benefit in developing and emerging economies. We are today now supporting over 100 organizations in over 30 countries. We're three years, three to half, three and a half to four years through that program. Our projects, however, are match funded. They're not solely developed through the auspices of finance from the UK Space Agency. And we believe that's very important to get all players in the programs to contribute, either in time or in funding or resources. And they always include a business case. So one of the panels I'm particularly interested in hearing about during this conference will be the financial modeling. Because I have to say, it's probably no longer so much about technology as about financing these programs and raising human capacity. The projects we have funded range across agricultural yield to typhoon predictions, but the theme binding them is always about satellite-enabled data. But I have to say, in the proposals that we put forward, 
We often do not like to see the words space or satellites mentioned in them. We want the data to be used, but it's not necessarily the focus for the activity. Will the end users gain true benefit, true merit, by understanding what their problems really are? And that's why over 20% of our program is spent on measuring and evaluation. To us, this is the key issue we have to establish today. We have to demonstrate to other government departments who often are not as positive about space agencies as we all might like to wish, because fundamentally they are facing funding challenges as we all are. We have to demonstrate that we are useful to other government departments, that we can provide services to other government departments. And to do that, it is necessary to demonstrate true sustainable progress. For us, failure is an option. We learn what does not work, and we share best practice. Those of you who are able to access the internet, I would please encourage you to look at something called www.spaceforddevelopment.organization, and you will see that this week we have just released our first compendium of space solutions that cover over 50 such project examples that perhaps may be of interest to you all here this week. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Let me now introduce uh, Val Munzami, the uh, CEO of the uh, South African uh, National uh, Space Agency, but also the uh, vice, one of the vice presidents of the uh, IAF. And uh, Val is very active also in the regional uh, cooperation, making, making him probably one of the most important uh, space leader in Africa. Val. Thanks, Jean Pascal, and it's uh, exciting to be here. Um, so just from a South African perspective, the South African National Space Agency is a fairly new agency, established in 2011. So I thought I'd use this platform just to share our experience in establishing the space program. So starting with why is space science and technology important for a developing country? And what's interesting to note is that many government departments across uh, in the South African landscape have been using satellite imagery both to make informed policy choices and also to monitor the impl implementation of those policies. And so satellite imagery was quite well used in the South African landscape. The plus side of it was that, you know, we, we got this community, but the negative side of it was that each and every government department was going out into the open market and buying satellite imagery from international vendors. And so you have the same image being used in South Africa, but being paid multiple times for uh, by the various government departments. And so coordination became an important aspect. So when the agency was established, you started to negotiate a single user, uh, a single multi-user license where you procure an image, but it's used multiple times across the government landscape. And so that brought a, a lot of cost savings on the South African uh, space program. We also started to look at how do we bootstrap the historical investments that we've made as a country. And just to give you a sense, South Africa has been involved in multi-wavelength astronomy since the 1880s. So those facilities are in South Africa at the moment. And from a space operations facilities point of view, we've been involved in space operations since the 1960s. In fact, the Deep Space Network, the NASA Deep Space Network, was uh, one of them was in South Africa and we supported uh, the Mars uh, mission, as an example, the lunar missions, and so on. And we've taken that even further at the moment, and we've got probably one of the biggest uh, space operations sites in Africa. Uh, well, definitely uh, the biggest. And with regards to space science facilities, we've had investments since the 1930s, because before GPS came on the lands landscape, we used magnetic compasses. And so we had a magnetic observatory in the 1930s, and we've used that uh, and build upon that to look at space weather phenomena and so on. And then we also have a satellite engineering and launch capabilities in the 1980s, which unfortunately we had to dismantle because of international pressure, given the connection with the nuclear weapons program that South Africa had in the 1980s. So we had to look at how do we bootstrap those capabilities and build up a space program. But what is important is with the new administration coming in in 1994 when we won our democracy, there was a number of policy shifts. And you have to also understand that uh, the space sector doesn't sit in isolation. 
it's actually sits on top of the science landscape, the science and technology landscape. And so in 2002, the National Research and Development Strategy identified that astronomy and space science was one of the geographic advantages for South Africa. And then when we look at 2007, there was a big study done by the OECD around innovation in South Africa. And that gave birth to the 10-year innovation plan. And in the 10-year innovation plan, we were trying to move South Africa from a natural-based economy to a knowledge-based economy. And we recognized that we had to crack a number of challenges that we had. And one of them was space science and technology, because government has already been using space science and technology. And that gave rise to a number of policy and strategy instruments. So the National Space Policy, the National Space Strategy, and even the Sensor Act itself was approved in 2008. So the policy landscape shifted to allow for the space program. And what is interesting is when we started the space agency, the first discussion we had in uh, constructing the space strategy was to bring all the government departments together in the same room. And there was over 30 government departments represented. And we asked of them, what do you want of the space agency once it's established? And what we got was very interesting is a whole list of priority requirements from government. And there were three categories that we segmented it into. The first was environmental and resource management. The second was health, safety, and security. And the third was innovation and economic growth. So in setting up the space program, we took a very user-driven uh, kind of approach to say, how can the space agency meet the requirements of government? And so if you look at the mandate of SENSA as it currently stands, the first is that we have to look at developing the local industry. It was not intended for the space agency to implement those programs. So we were actually an enabler. The second is we had to build the requisite human capital. So we have a big bursary program where we send students through, uh, support students through the masters and PhD levels. And then we also had to establish the necessary infrastructure. So as an agency, our core mandate is to ensure that the base infrastructure is in place so that we support industry. And industry doesn't have to invest in that key infrastructure. And by doing all of the above, we can then ensure that we effectively respond to what government has asked us to do in terms of meeting the user requirements. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Val. Our speaker now is uh, uh, Dr. Nabiyev, the chairman of uh, Azer Cosmos. And um, he is uh, leading, of course, the Azeris uh, investment in, in space, which are quite uh, impressive and in different uh, areas. I think this is a very important example and very interesting example of the uh, uh, space uh, benefits for uh, emerging countries, please. Oh, thank you, Pascal. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, let me start with saying that historically, the aim of the space and space program uh, meant to help the government to uh, tackle their uh, development goals. But uh, what we have seen over the years, at the same time, the space and space program uh, fosters the new forms of the pride uh, national power and the prestige. And in some cases, unfortunately, the governments lost the sense of why, why they started their space programs and they were uh, uh, falling in the trap of this pride and the national prestige. And in many cases, they just didn't know what they meant and what, why they started these programs. And when it comes to uh, new or so-called uh, emerging nations, they are not exempt from these rules and they're also falling into this trap. And what can be the remedy for this, not to fall into this trend? I believe that we can draw a great example from the private sector. If you look at any, any private company which is successful in the market, they have a so-called golden circle, which is as following. Before doing anything, they start with thinking why they're doing this. And then ultimately they think how they're gonna do this. And the end product is what? So when we started, uh, uh, our programs. Uh, actually, let me say, say that, do we have a moral right to say that we are emerging nation, uh, Azerbaijan? The answer is ambiguous, yes and no. No, because our uh, space program was a part of the Soviet Union space program, and then at the time, 
during the 25 years when we started 1973, by the time uh, 1991, uh, we had more than 2,000 people employed in the space sector. But unfortunately, due to the collapse of the Soviet Union and the transition period, we had to dismantle this uh, sector of economy and cease these activities. And we had to restart from year 2008. So first question we asked ourselves, why we are doing this? And we put it in a very straightforward way by the decision makers and by president, is that it should answer and, and tackle our immediate social development goals. And the second point was that uh, being located in the region which is not that much secure, it should answer to our national security uh, needs or put information security including. The third question was, it, uh, while we will be doing these programs, we have to gain uh, from the international uh, cooperation uh, which will might necessarily have a spin-off effect in other sectors of, of economy. And of course, uh, the ultimate goal was to take the space and the space activity to the next level, which was meant at the time to research and development. And the way how we saw it, so to answer the question how we were seeing this at the time, all the projects we had to run at the time, they should have gone through the one single test, being cash neutral, not being trapped in the, the, into the uh, temptation of in investing a lot into the infrastructure uh, projects which are not paying off. And of course, the last question, what we're gonna do, what we did over the last uh, seven years, actually, we launched two satellites, two telecommunication satellite and one Earth observation satellite. If you ask me today, did we answer all these questions in the right way? The answer is definitely yes. And now the, uh, we are ready to take it to the next level, to the research and development, just one example is that the engineers who are involved in day-to-day -day business activities, they're getting very much bored. So we have been able to raise a critical mass of engineers who are ready to take it to the next level. And we ultimately came to the point we established the research and development lab within the uh, operator of the Cosmos, which meant to be a commercial operator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam uh, Senator Dominique uh, Tillmans, we are very happy to have you here for many reasons. The first one being that uh, uh, you are a political leader, and this is quite important uh, for our uh, activities. And the second reason is that you, are, you have been a space fan for many years now, so we are very delighted to have you here today. Uh, you are chairing the uh, EURESI uh, organization, which is, uh, if I may summarize, maybe the gathering of the uh, users of uh, space activities. And I leave you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean Pascal. Well, let me say directly the difference of space. You know, space is where you least expect it. Only a few years ago, space was inaccessible for most of the people. And gradually, space contributes to the general economy. More recently, it has become more social and a part of our everyday life, fostering the socioeconomic development of our society. What will be the next challenges from my point of view? The emerging countries, the rural regions, and the downstream sector. Space application are one of the key factors according to the needs of the final users, but also responding to political and economic context. Where the downstream sector is growing and the user community clearly identified the fertile environment favors the adoption of innovative solutions. But, 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 it's not true everywhere. The lack of technical knowledge or infrastructure, dedicated funds or political sensibility make it complicated and create a gap, not only in emerging countries, also 
in rural regions and even in, in Europe too. Being president of ERISI and also a career politician, I know how important and difficult it's to sensitive politicians. Of course, minister at national level and representative of big cities, but not only, also those who take decisions at the regional and the level and, and the local level. Direct relations with politicians and civil servants are essential. They are the ones who chose the guidelines of their territory and, and are decision makers. One of the ongoing projects of ERISI, Space for Rural, demonstrates the importance of working with them and give a clear view where space can be a facilitator in development and a lever for the enterprises. Even if ERISI mostly focuses on Europe, the improvement of rural areas is something that involves also emerging, emerging countries. I know, I know we are talking about different context, different background, and different dedicated policy. But the challenges are the same. Developing the connectivity, facilitating the socioeconomic development, investing in education and in staff training, making space accessible and more comprehensive to the people. In conclusion, I would like to thank Jean-Yves Le Gall, Pascal Irenfre, Driss Ladani, Jean-Pascal Lefranc, Ivana Nathan, Munsani, and I don't want to forget, of course, Christian Feitinger for organizing this conference, which reminds us that space, of course, advances science and opens the doors of the universe. But space really achieves its goals when it fully shares its technological progress for a sustainable development on Earth and for the human well-being, both in developed and emerging countries. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Zahran from the uh, National Authority for Remote Sensing and Space Sciences of Egypt. We are very happy that uh, Egypt is uh, represented in this uh, conference. We think it is a very uh, good opportunity to listen to your own experience. And please, thank you. Thank you, the Chairman. I thank me as the last speaker after all these stars of uh, space science and technology. It's very difficult to find something to say, but I will try to find something. First of all, I would like to introduce uh, NARS. NARS is a leading governmental organization in Egypt that is mandating with research and development multi of multidisciplinary field of remote sensing and space science. I would like to answer the question, which is the title of this session. Is the space technology as boosted impact or benefit for emerging uh, countries? Of course, the answer is yes. Remote sensing is applied in many countries to evaluate the strategic goals. By using remote sensing, we can monitor the environment, we can discover the water resources, we can lead the activities of urban layout, we can apply geological and natural resources discovering by using remote sensing image, we can apply modern agricultural development and we can avoid the disaster and the emergency uh, that could be happened. Of course, remote sensing has direct impact and or positive impact on health, transportation, economical growth, because we can found a new job, new markets, and increase the efficiency of the life, and life quality will be good and more safe by remote sensing. I will say something about uh, the NARS activity in the last, uh, only in the last year. NARS participate in Egypt to discover millions of tons of iron in Egypt desert. NARS in the last year discovered the water basin 
not only the location of the water, but the source from water, this, uh, this water is coming, and the sustainability of this water for how many years this water will sustain. NARS make analysis for the most of Egyptian desert that you know that we have about 94% of Egypt is desert. NARS make analysis for this desert to estimate which soil is proper for which plant and to, to give the farmer and to give the, the, the government an uh, exact guide to uh, develop uh, this rural area, uh, areas. And uh, of course, to have remote sensing, you have to have images, images coming from satellite. You have two ways to have this image. Even you are, either you, are, you, you, are, you have to have a uh, space program to uh, design and fabricate your own satellite, or you can produce image. But at least you have to have data reception station and image processing. And in Egypt, we have both. We have more than two data reception station located in south and north of Egypt. And we have a space program about 20 years old. We have now one satellite in orbit. We have two satellites at launcher waiting to be launched. The, fir the first one will be launched in next September, and the second one at the end of this year. We have two satellites under development. One of them is a cooperation with China, the other one cooperation with Germany. These two satellites will be launched next year, at the end of next year. Now we are installing an assembly and integration testing lab. I think the biggest one in the Middle East. Uh, it can accommodate satellite starting with cube satellite, one U, until satellite with a size of one ton. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so there, there has been a lot of uh, questions uh, coming from the audience, and I will try to, to summarize them uh, in, in one big question that uh, could be the, the, the start of the, the conversation, and which is about the uh, cooperation. What about cooperation, regional cooperation? What about cooperation between established space agencies versus uh, emerging countries' uh, space agencies? What about cooperation between uh, space agencies and industry? So if you, if you could uh, elaborate on, on, this, on these general items or choose, pick up what, what one, one of those, uh, I would be grateful. Maybe uh, Mob could be starting. Uh, happy to uh, talk about UAE space uh, program. Uh, our space program is based on cooperation. Uh, local cooperation, regional and international. Uh, as emerging uh, space uh, nation, we are hungry for uh, uh, technology and knowledge, especially in space. This is cannot be uh, materialized, uh, you know, unless you uh, be uh, cooperating uh, in all levels. Uh, we have um, uh, we are very active in international uh, cooperation. We uh, signed the most with every space uh, agency. Uh, we are active in United Nations. We are active in uh, space events. We uh, we use this uh, gathering uh, to learn, to engage, and to network. Uh, simply because we believe that space is all about cooperation. Uh, people, uh, uh, agencies, uh, countries. Uh, just to uh, give you an idea about how active in terms of uh, space events, you know, recently we have a Global Space Congress in Abu Dhabi, uh, but uh, next year we will host, you know, IAC. Uh, as you know, we are using this as a platform to engage and to, ex uh, to learn actually from uh, other um, space nation. I think it's a key for emerging space nation to put cooperation, collaboration uh, locally, regionally, internationally, on the, the agenda. Uh, otherwise, it will take you know uh, longer. Uh, it costs more, and it will imply high risk. Thank you. Thank you, Mad. Um, maybe Val, you would like to intervene on this. Uh, th thank you, Chair, for that. So, if you're an emerging space nation, I think you, you also need to realize that you cannot operate in isolation because. Space, by its very nature, 
and you have to look at it from different levels. So within the National Space Program, you're working on an ecosystem, uh, a science, technology, innovation ecosystem. And your roots will essentially look at how you link up with the other public sector institutions and the industry at a national level. And how do you leverage that as a collective capability? And then get into these international partnerships. Because effectively, uh, if you look in this room, how many countries up, I mean, this is in Morocco, it's in the African continent, but how many countries from Africa are represented here? And if you are not in the room, in the discussion, then you're effectively not participating. So the first number one rule is obviously be in the room where these things are happening and in discussions like this. And so you have to step up to the table, be engaged at the international level. And from a Sansa perspective, I think in the last year we've signed pr probably about a dozen different agreements because we real realize that not every nation can do everything in the global uh, sp space value chain, that you have to leverage some of those capabilities from other um, uh, industry plays, other agencies, and so on. And you have to be very strategic in your choices as to what you're going to do in terms of your niche um, areas that you want to work with. So working inside your ecosystem and then also working outside in terms of international partnerships and understanding where exactly you play. Thank you. I see that Pascal would like to intervene. Yeah, I think that the cooperation um, uh, works on many different levels because as we have seen, the space sector has many stakeholders. And I think if an emerging country has to profit you know, from, from, from knowledge, uh, from technology, uh, and uh, future visions of um, larger research organizations, space agencies, then I think it has to be on, on many different levels. And well, uh, the German Aerospace Center um, works with, I think, uh, more than 400 partners in 60 countries. So we are very, very active, um, uh, in particular also in, 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 in space research. Um, and the cooperation uh, and um, learning from, from each other and, 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 and sharing in uh, research uh, and technology development is the most easy because it comes naturally. And very often universities and, and, and research organizations work together all over the world um, uh, already without any kind of really uh, stimulus or, or, or financial commitment. So this is, a, I think, a very strong basis. So um, actually, DLR has a program uh, concerning the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Um, it has uh, more than 500 projects which uh, are associated to this kind of program. And um, they are here in order to be matched. Uh, and we are working you know, with emerging nations, but also uh, with uh, a lot of organizations worldwide in order to, uh, to uh, share uh, uh, the technology and research uh, results of, um, of this program. But uh, of course, it's also industries. And um, our space administration works on B2B models, uh, uh, goes into the countries, uh, let, uh, uh, let industry meet and, and try to find matches and, and, and future activities. And then obviously uh, it is capacity building and uh, I think every organization is doing that in one way. We have heard some examples, but we have 1,000 PhD students in, in, in at uh, German Aerospace Center and we have over 500 visiting scientists out of 90 countries. And this is an exchange, uh, how to build a new workforce and capacity building, I think, is one of, of the major uh, um, uh, additional assets. Um, so uh, I think it has to be on, on many different levels uh, uh, where um, uh, you know, uh, strong organizations uh, connect to emerging countries. And um, uh, it has to be, um, I think, we have also to, uh, uh, there has to be a component where emerging countries which do not know yet in what direction to go, that there is a platform of information, which I think is actually one of, of this Congress, uh, these Congresses and others. Thank you very much. Dries, you would like to intervene? Yes, I would like to stress 
two or three points concerning cooperation in the space field, but uh, from the beginning, cooperation was a, a, a key element in space activities and the creation of the, of the COPUS, UN Committee on Space and uh, Space, uh, Peace Useful of Sciences in Space is, is very important to stress that um, allowed uh, to promote cooperation between countries. The second element and that I would like to stress is there is a, a lot of opportunities of cooperation between North and South countries, but we should also work on the initiative to develop South-South cooperation. And I think there is some initiative right now and they're, and they're going that will certainly contribute to develop cooperation in this area. I would like to thank my colleague and my friend, uh, Dr. Ahbari, for his initiative to create this Arab group to promote cooperation within the Arab region. And I think Africa has uh, a lot to gain in developing cooperation in, in our region also. And this initiative launched by the uh, African Union to establish this uh, African Space Agency, I think will also uh, offer an opportunity to develop cooperation between African countries and trying to leverage all the, 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 the benefits of space in, in this region. Thank you. Thank you, please. Dr. Nabiyev. Yeah, I can elaborate on the, uh, how these uh, big agencies, established agencies and the small ones, newcomers can uh, collaborate. I mean, as we are living in the age of disruptive technologies, it's not secret that uh, all the disruptive technologies usually come from the small players. And I, the first thing that the big players have to appreciate that uh, the advantages that small players can bring on the table. If we look at this uh, IT uh, uh, sector of economy, uh, we will never see that, once again, that big and disruptive uh, technologies coming from the big players. Uh, if you look how Amazon started their business, they never started selling everything, they just started selling their books. If we look at the Uber, they started within the uh, boundaries of one city. The same could easily be applied to Facebook. The Facebook started within the boundaries of one single university. So the whole point here is that the small markets would, can be a very good uh, domain to start and to test new technologies, and especially the ones uh, when it comes to Earth observation and data analysis and artificial intelligence. And then from that point, we can actually take it to the re regional level and, and, and to, to uh, world markets. So, this aspect is uh, very important in, in uh, operations. Thank you very much. Well, unfortunately, time uh, is flying and uh, we, we may have to conclude very soon. Any other uh, info, in, intervention, any, any other comment before, before we declare that we will go to lunch? Yes, please. Uh, one observation I was struck by when looking at Driss's, one of his first view graphs, which if he doesn't mind, I'm gonna shamelessly copy in my future talks, uh, where you had the, um, the ages and you had the space age and then you had the uh, uh, communications and, and AI. One of the observations you can often make is space agencies often try to promote themselves on the basis of STEM. Uh, in the UK, that's the science, technology, engineering, and maths. We're trying to encourage, essentially, engineering to take place, and we often look at space technology as a way to bring those engineers in. And I know in sustainable uh, development, it's often used as a, as a reason why space is attractive. It's inspirational. It brings them in. But what do you think that the future markets are going to be more about the downstream? And the downstream is often about the analysis of data and the future markets involving AI. It, it does strike me that if you were to be setting up a new space agency and you were thinking about the future ecosystem for your, um, for your purpose, you might well really want to focus on the application side, the bottom, if you like, of the pyramid, so that you create a culture that brings together communications and software and computing, perhaps more so than hard engineering activities. So perhaps we've reached a point where space agencies of one flavor give over to a space agency of a new flavor where the focus is on software, AI, uh, data analysis, and data mining activities. And, and that's one lesson I shall take away from, uh, from this discussion. Madame? If, if, I, if I can make some recommendation, of course, I, sp I spoke about emerging, emerging countries, uh, rural region, and uh, connectivity, but also 
in STEM, I completely agree. Do you know in Europe we have 47,000 people who are working in the space sector? The average age is 44. Okay, it's perfect. But the people between uh, uh, 45, 49 and 59 years old uh, represent 35% of all the staff. It means a lot of retirement during these decades. And today, the companies, the, the, the enterprise, have a lot of difficulties to recruit. So for the young people, it is really important to know that in the space, uh, it's, uh, it's important they can have a job. That's important. And second, and last recommendation, we must invest in the communication to make it easy and not too technique. I think it's really, really important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I think uh, the, this uh, panel needs a big round of applause and we will conclude like this. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jean Pascal, for the excellent moderation and a big thanks to all the distinguished speakers. It was a very, very comprehensive panel here. Um, if I may ask you to remain seated for a few more minutes um, because we are now finishing our session one and moving slowly into the lunch time. And uh, before we go to lunch, I would like to acknowledge our sponsor for today's lunch, uh, and this is Airbus Defense and Space, a member of our federation since 1988. And to represent our sponsor, Airbus, um, and give us a short address, I would like to invite to come on stage Dr. Oliver Juckenhöfer, Senior Vice President for On Orbit Services, Airbus Defense and Space in Bremen, Germany. Dr. Juckenhöfer is in charge of the On Orbit Services and Exploration activities within Airbus Defense and Space, and he is also the head of the company's Bremen site in Germany. He has held this position since November 2016, and he is responsible uh, for the European contribution to NASA's Orion program, the operation and utilization of the International Space Station's Columbus module, and the development of innovative robotic servicing solutions for space infrastructure. Dr. Juckenhofer, please. Well, thank you, Christian. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And isn't that paradox? I'm enabling lunch, and now I'm taking you away from lunch. I'm trying to make that as short as possible. I think we have a short video that I would like to show you. Actually, I'm not sure who can help me on that technically. Here it comes.
this is not an Airbus video. This is a video of a governmental agency, CONIDA in Peru, which is explaining, I think, in, a, in an excellent way, how the step into being a space nation, a spacefaring nation, how it can happen in an easy way, because I agree very often things that we do, if we're upstream and building satellites, they sound so difficult, right? This satellite was delivered after two years and is now in service uh, with the first experiences for more than one year of operation. And this satellite is operated by Peru. The data that it's generating are reviewed by local national experts and they're exploited for the benefit of the country. And Conida was very proud in communicating that already after one year, their original invest was returned. And it's planned for a total of a decade of operation. So it is more successful than they thought. What the video also shows is that it's not just on data to make your country more safe or to get it under control in terms of environmental, is also what we are calling outreach, or call it STEM initiative. You've seen the little kids, and Conida have started, while pursuing this project, from the beginning to, to plan for outreach and to explain to the population what they are doing. And already after the first year, they have reached a level of 25,000 people that they communicated in detail about what they are doing there with PeruSats. And that was exactly the number that they planned to reach after 10 years. So this demonstrates elegantly how successful such an invest in such a program can be. Now, when Gunita signed the contract with Airbus, they would get access to data from day one. So they didn't have to wait for their satellites to be in orbit. That was part of the contract. And that demonstrates how, in a slightly different way, you can get access to space yourself. You don't need to build or pursue space infrastructure to have access, because really what we talk about is the benefit of utilization of space assets. So you could, for instance, use the Airbus One Atlas platform to get data of Earth observation satellite, be it in optical regime, be it in radar regime, to test and experiment on your own business cases, to try out, to help startups build business cases in your country without waiting for expensive infrastructure being built and operated. And while you're doing that, you will be learning, and maybe the next step that you decide on is that you want to have your own downlink station in your country. So it is almost like a stairway to heaven that you can gradually develop your capabilities for the benefit of your society. And having said that, it's not just on satellites. I want to give you another example where we are collaborating with the United Nations. And the platform for collaboration is the International Space Station. It's all the greatest goods that humankind has built and is now operating over 20 years. And we have recently made an investment with the support of the European Space Agency in a platform that we call Bartolomeo. It's like a small balcony, and we attach it to the Columbus Research Lab of the International Space Station. So that is not, not something special. But what is special about it is that we can operate it as a commercial satellite, which is reconfigurable, because fortunately, there are astronauts, like the one very soon from the UAE, which are helping us to maintain the International Space Station. So consider it as a platform where in the context of a sharing economy, you can bring your payload, you can bring it for a certain time period, you can work with it for research, for experimentation, for in-orbit validation, or you can have your own business case by routing out a sensor and using those data. And we can help you make this happen. So until now, only those countries were having access to the International Space Station who participated to it, or who had somebody, a friend, who could help them get access. Now we can commercialize it, which demonstrates that as the larger spacefaring nations are learning, they're opening up for more collaboration. And we're really looking forward uh, to the collaboration with the United Nations because it will open up opportunities for countries around the world to come with ideas. And we know from experience that some of these project ideas to fly on Bartolomeo will be extremely sophisticated already technically very sound proposals, and some others will be more visionary. 
like the dreams of kids that you've seen in the video. So I think this will serve the purpose of developing that. And then while we are talking on data and platforms, it is really at the end on business. And Airbus is doing quite an effort to support startups, in particular here in Africa, where our biz lab, where we're testing ourselves with external partners, new innovative business ideas. We have the Africa for Future initiative, where already now in the second project phase, we're working and collaborating with startups to help them use these data and develop their own countries. So thank you very much for the IAF to organizing this because we believe that it is highly important to close this gap and enable more and more countries having access to space and utilizing space for the benefit of the development of their countries. And I think that an event like, like the GLEC here is excellent in order to discuss all the opportunities, how to connect and work together. Because let's not forget that space is universal and space will never work without collaboration. And that as the larger nations will now go move forward to moon and explore, there'll be a lot of room for others to come up and keep up with space and you know, enter into the low Earth orbit and enter into an orbital economy. And this is open for your countries as it is for anybody else. Thank you very much for your attention, for having us here. It will be a pleasure to host you now with lunch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jochen Höfel, and thanks again to the great panel here. We now break for lunch, and I would ask you all to be back here at 2.40, please. 2.40. Thank you.